Welcome, everybody. It is a great pleasure uh, to see so many faces uh, for this fourth and for this time last um, instance of our spring 2022 online seminar uh, in the track Empires, History, Cities and Discontents of the Global Urban History um, uh, Project. Uh, we are hosting today Heba Ahmed. Uh, and uh, Heba, I think um, I may just uh, basically turn over to you so that you can introduce yourself, introduce your topic and you know title, um, and uh, then get started. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, sir. Um, and good evening to everyone listening to me. And first of all, I would like, like to really thank uh, Cyrus for inviting me on board this urban history project and for allowing me to be a part of this exciting series of lectures. It was amazing to hear the other participants and slightly intimidated by the excellent presentations which I've heard before. So uh, today my presentation will be based on uh, my PhD thesis, which currently I'm working on. And my thesis is on uh, the city of Calcutta, which is my hometown, and it's currently known as Kolkata. And I am looking at the process of migration of laborers to colonial Calcutta. And this process of migration happened from states which were impoverished or de-industrialized because of British colonial rule and a steady process of proletarianization in which cultivators lo uh, located in the agrarian uh, locations had to move to the city to join the new factories which were established by the British. So that is what I'm looking at. And um, it is well near impossible to, you know, to study the colonial history of Calcutta without going into the literature which has been produced by so many British historians about Calcutta. And a lot of this, a lot of this literature, you know, connects with nostalgia, with imperial nostalgia, with colonial myths of foundation, and you know, heroism, heroic myths of the white man's burden. So I will get into all of that uh, during the course of my presentation. And uh, just, just one thing I would like to uh, state here that when I was growing up, I remember uh, it was once when I was in class nine or class 10 and we were asked to write uh, a school essay in the language, in my second language, which is Bangla. And we were supposed to write the essay on, on my hometown, on, on the hometown. So when I was collecting facts for this essay, I asked my mother about what can I possibly write about the city of Calcutta? And she said that right in the city of Calcutta was established by Job Charnock. So that memory, and when I read the foundation myths of British historians and the way these myths have been cultivated, especially regarding the foundation of Calcutta by Job Charnock, that, that's an interesting parallel to draw. So having uh, given that personal note, I will begin my presentation and I think I will switch off my camera just so that uh, my audio is uninterrupted. Uh, apologies for any inconvenience caused because of that. Uh, so in his essay, The City Imagined, Calcutta of the 19th and early 20th centuries, the historian Sumit Sarkar points out that British writings about Calcutta are suffused with imperialist pride and nostalgia. And he argues that much of this nostalgia is focused on the neoclassical architectural wonders of the white town or Sahib Para. Sahib Para is Bengali for white, Sahib is the Bengali word for the white man and Para is locality. Sahib Para or the white town. There was a white town and a black town in colonial Calcutta. So the Sahib Para white town was the part of the city which housed the commercial and administrative establishments as well as the residential quarters of the Europeans. And uh, this white town earned for Calcutta the nickname of being the city of palaces. So the edifices of the white town, which represented the British monopoly upon the economy of Bengal, uh, they, they represented the, the fact that the entire economy of Bengal was in British hands, which composed of you know, the, the center of the Jews and cotton factories, the headquarters were in the white town of Calcutta. The, the, the headquarters of the manufacturing concerns, the tea plantations, coal mining industry, the, the, the hub of colonial finance and trade, all of it was located in the capital of Bengal, that is Calcutta. Calcutta was also, but apart from all of this, apart from the commercial and trade trading concerns, Calcutta was also the site for constructing the ideological facade of empire, the purport of which was to historicize the onset of modernity in the city and to monumentalize narratives of the past in a way 
which would make it an object to be recuperated from supposed decline and neglect and restore it as a source of sentimental pride for the British. So for example, um, and from here onwards, I will quote actual historical writings on Calcutta. So for example, uh, Sir Harry Evan August Cotton, better known as Evan Cotton, in his voluminous work, it's a 1000 page work, Calcutta Old and New, published in 1907. He writes that the story of Calcutta is full of romantic vicissitudes, strange events and heroism. And he commemorates names and locations from early British imperialism in Bengal. Uh, quoting him, Fort William linked imperishably with the fame of Clyde. Garden Reach, once studded with the riverside villas of merchant princes. Park Street, the dear park of old Sir Elijah MP, writer's building, and the marble replica of Holwell's monument to his fellow sufferers in the black hole." Unquote. Uh, just after giving this list of places and names, um, uh, Evan Cotton immediately starts off on a note of melancholia when he writes that, other memories of the past of Calcutta have perished, whether from the ravages of time or the incuriousness of those in office. So Cotton, uh, Cotton says that the purpose of his writing this history, you know, this voluminous Calcutta old and new is, to, uh, quote him, quoting him, to do justice to Calcutta not only in her bygone, but in her modern aspect, to recall the historical associations of Calcutta, to remind the citizen no less than the stranger within her gates of her vanished buildings and changed localities and to commemorate the men who have helped to make the city what it is. Uh, I'm sorry, if, am I not audible anymore? No, you're please? perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, so it, it was not just Evan Cotton. Similarly, H.E. Bastide, he was an essay master, essay master in the Calcutta Mint. And even in his book, which is from 1888, he also starts his book with a note of lamentation. And the title of his book is Echoes from Old Calcutta, being chiefly the reminiscences of the days of Warren Hastings, Francis, and Impey. That's the title of his book. And he writes in his book, uh, quote, the past seems to be a sealed book, unquote. And the generation of the present goes on, quote, knowing or caring little of the generations which dwelt before it, unquote. And even Bastid, you know, like Cotton, who came after him, the note of nostalgia for a past which seemingly is forgotten by the counterparts in Britain, that nostalgia is very much there, suffused there. Quoting him again, this is a lengthy quote, to those who are tired of the warfare and controversies of modern politics and literature, or fatigued with the routine of business, or with the weary gaieties which constitute the conventional monotony of modern Calcutta life, it would be a relief to occasionally try and seek refuge in a bygone world and in its records to learn something of the social and political life of the predecessors. Such a retrospect, far from being profitless or dull, would at least enable them to take an intelligent interest in the many sights and scenes in their midst, which are intimately associated with memorable events and with the historic names of their own countrymen and which are now daily passed by without even curiosity being awakened because so little is known of those who flourished or who faded in Calcutta of the olden time. So if you will notice, there is a similar complaint or a similar lament in both uh, Cotton's words and Bastide's words that you know, the past of Calcutta has been forgotten, that it has not been commemorated enough. And it is extremely essential to revive, to resuscitate that glorious past of early British imperialism to, the, to, to its rightful place under the sun. So these are not the only historians, you know, Bastille and Cotton were not the only historians to take up this pedagogical task of instructing the colonial state and the colonial society, namely, you know, in Britain and in Calcutta both, uh, about the early history of conquest. This pedagogy included an admonition to the colonial state for failing to recognize, remember, or take adequate pride in that history. Uh, in 1840, and of course, Macaulay's name is more well known to um, anyone in India, Thomas Babington Macaulay had written a similar accusation in his essay on Clive. Now, um, before I, I read from this uh, essay on Clive, um, I'll just introduce what this text is. Macaulay, uh, Patu Chatterjee tells us that uh, Macaulay's reputation is one of the most famous, foremost ideologues of the liberal middle-class Victorian Britain. 
and this is highlighted by the fact that Macaulay's essays and his writings are read by you know, many generations of high school and university students preparing for examinations. And, uh, and uh, uh, so this essay on Clyde, this is also, you know, it set, a, it set the standard for what ordinary English readers expected to read or what, it, it, it set a standard for the kind of literature which was fed to people in Britain in the heyday of empire. So I'll, I'll quote from this essay on Clyde. Uh, it might have been expected that every Englishman who takes any interest in any part of history would be curious to know how a handful of his countrymen separated from their home by an immense ocean, subjugated in the course of a few years, one of the greatest empires in the world. Yet, unless we greatly err, this subject is to most readers not only insipid, but positively distasteful. Perhaps the fault lies partly with historians, unquote. So again, the same note of lamentation and Macaulay goes on further to accuse fellow historians for not taking adequate interest in glorifying the beginnings of empire in India. Um, so Macaulay was, like I said, like I said before quoting Patel Chatterjee, that he was one of the most famous ideologues of empire. Cotton was a barrister in the High Court of Calcutta, 1893 to 1906. And he was also a member of the Calcutta Corporation also a member of uh, liberal member of parliament of the UK parliament. And he was also chairman of the Indian Historical Records Commission from 1923 to 1925. So if you see Macaulay, Cotton and Basti, you know, Basti worked in the Calcutta Mint. Cotton had so many positions, designations in his lifetime. All of them were members of the colonial apparatus, the colonial state apparatus. And therefore they were proponents and spokespersons of the empire. Like other historians of colonial Britain, they were prominent among architects of British power. And to quote a recent work uh, written by Priya Satya, uh, the name of the book is Time's Monster, how uh, uh, the story of how Britain, Imperial Britain wrote its own history. And Priya Satya writes that the rule of historians coincided with the era of British imperialism. And um, you know, that the history was, that the, these historians who wrote uh, in this manner, you know, Busteed, Cotton, Macaulay, and there are countless others, that they were abetting imperial power. They were providing a moral legitimacy to it. So it was not enough to simply provide uh, a legitimacy to empire by lionizing and uh, exculpating the violent conquests of men like Clive. If you read the essay on Clive by Macaulay, it's actually providing a moral justification for all the, uh, all the things which Clive did. Uh, in his tenure in, in Bengal, in his, during his conquests in Bengal. And also, uh, uh, his essay also completely lambasts, castigates Nawab Siraj Dola of Bengal, the person whom Clive defeated. So, um, uh, works, these historical works lionize uh, Clive, people like Clive, and they castigate people like Nawab Siraj Dola of Bengal. And Clive actually, uh, sorry, Macaulay actually calls. Uh, you know, Raju Dola, as an oriental despot who has no reason or understanding except hatred for the British. And he is, you know, he has, he is debauched, he is immoral, and that he is literally unfit to do. Basically, that's, that's the point. That's the thrust of his essay. So um, th this is how the mythology of empire was constructed, by portraying the nobility of the colonizing mission by portraying the oriental debauchery and uh, oriental uh, uh, degener degeneracy of the of, uh, rulers like Nawab Siraj Dola of Bengal. So Patra Chatterjee writes that the black hole of empire through its contested narrativization and memorialization in Calcutta presents the myth of heroism of East India Company officials like John Zephania Holwell. Now, uh, some of you may be aware of what the black hole tragedy is. It's a very, uh, uh, one of the foundational myths of the, uh, British Empire in Bengal, where uh, uh, Nawab Siraj uh, uh, took over the Fort William of Calcutta, and when he captured the uh, the British residents of the fort, you know the people who worked there, etc. Most of them fled. Most of them had fled, but the ones who were captured, they were put into this airless dungeon-type room, uh, and overnight, most of them perished. Now there is a, a lot has been written on this and how, whether this was a fabricated uh, event 
whether the person who, who is most famous for narrativizing this black hole tragedy, John Zephania Holville, uh, now it is said that he was lying, that he fabricated the whole narrative. And that uh, everybody, you know, Macaulay, Bastide, Evan Cotton, everybody who quotes John Zephania Holville, they are simply repeating one of the foundational you know, lies of empire, one of the foundational untruths of empire. And uh, on this, uh, part of the disease, the black hole of empire is quite the best reading to do. So uh, Chatterjee writes that the black hole of empire, because through its contested uh, narrativization and memorialization in Calcutta, it presents the heroism of people like John Zephania Holman. And it also, uh, the, the myth of the black hole of empire, it also shows that Nawab Tirajatola's attack on Fort William was nothing except gratuitous violence and cruelty. And therefore, Holwell and all the people who have chronicled the Black Hole tragedy, they, are, they simply justify the violence of colonial conquest as merely an act of retaliation for something which had been perpetrated on the British by people like uh, the rulers of Bengal. So they were simply responding to savage cruelty. They were simply responding to violence. That is how the violence of colonial annexation was justified. So quoting from another recent uh, work, called Imperialist Nostalgia uh, by Peter Mitchell. British imperialism did a particularly good line in masochistic fantasy and martyrology from the Black Hole of Calcutta and the massacre at the residency of Lucknow during the 1857 Indian uprising through the extravagant Protestant martyrdom of Central African missionaries like David Livingston to T. Lawrence's uh, explicit account of his torture and sexual assault in the Ottoman garrison. So these fantasies informed uh, the gender codes of empire and especially the new ways it created of being a man. They also furnished, where necessary, excuses for retaliatory savagery and more broadly for paternalist racial discipline and the sense of having suffered and its corollary of needing to find someone to punish for it continues to the present. So uh, we return to the theme of nostalgia because that is where I began. Uh, the theme of nostalgia, which is a constant subtext of colonial history. Uh, there is a, there's been a lot of re recent literature to suggest how uh, the theme of nostalgia is, you know, connected with the project of history writing. And uh, some of these works have connected uh, the onset of nostalgia as a psychological facet of modern society after the French Revolution. Um, and uh, there has not been much work on how uh, nostalgia has contributed to the whole foundation myth of um, Calcutta, and especially in the figure of Charno. I've, I've named here Robert Clive and John Zephania Holwell and the historians, but another equally uh, controversial and supposedly legendary figure of British imperialism and the start of the empire in, in Calcutta is, is Charno. Uh, before that, I would just like to um, share a, a few images. Uh, so I'll give you a context of the images which I'm going to share. Uh, some years ago, the Calcutta High Court had passed a judgment in which it had been said that Calcutta does not have a foundation date and that Job Chano can definitely not be called the, you know, the founder of Calcutta as uh, colonial history has recorded him to be. So, um, sorry, just let me find that image. Um, yeah, so uh, this is, am I audible? Sorry. Thank you yeah, someone you are, and we can see it. Yeah, so um, this is an image of uh, a history exhibition which was held actually in February 2022, so just a month ago, in Calcutta. And if you see the logo, it, it's, it's in Bengali. But what this, uh, the text in white over a red background, what it means is the library or museum uh, of the Savarna family, okay? And uh, this is the museum which is now uh, contesting the fact that did Charnok at all, uh, can Charnok at all be credited for the foundation of the city? But before we can come to this, I'd just like, I'd just like to introduce uh, the foundation mix of Calcutta a, bit, a little bit. So um, again, just like, you know, Charnok, uh, just sorry, just like Clive, and just like uh, the other heroes of the of British Empire in India, 
uh, Chanok also has considerable literature available about him. And interestingly, there is, uh, so Chanok is credited with founding, laying the foundation of Calcutta in 1690, you know, and then in 1990, uh, there, Calcutta also had the tercentenary celebrations so of 300 years of celebrating the foundation of Calcutta. And uh, even two volumes had come out then. So Calcutta, the Living City, uh, edited by Shukanta Chaudhary, uh, quite a well-known, uh, quite a well-known collection. But uh, the publication of this uh, two-part history of Calcutta goes on to show how the narrative of Charnock was continued even by Indian writers, even after 1947, even after you know independence, decolonization, what have you. So I'll just read a bit of um, uh, the, the book of, which came in 1990, Calcutta, The Living City. So we may, the editor writes, we may ask whether Calcutta really began 300 years ago. Certainly the British settlement, which became the official nucleus of today's Calcutta was set up in 1690, after abortive starts were made earlier, but the region had seen flourishing settlements from some time before. Shutanuti and Gobindupur, Kalighat, where the pilgrims came, the textile centers of Chitpur and Banaras. So um, even though this volume questions the fact whether Chano can be credited, despite that, there is an entire chapter on Job Charno, and there is an entire chapter talking about how he, it presents in a very heroic narrative of how he sailed to Calcutta and he had skirmishes with the Mughal Empire in Bengal at that time, and how he set up his factory in Calcutta despite the extremely unfavorable climate and despite the whole area being a swamp then, and how he, you know, civilized the land, how he cultivated the land. There is a, there's a lot of uh, myths regarding that. So, um, uh, yes. So, I'll just read a bit from uh, this book. It, the historian is called Siva Prasad Das Gupta, again from um, the tercentenary volume from 1990. Uh, in August 1690, when Job Charnock was looking for a good landing place on the Hooghly to set up an outpost of the East India Company, the present site of Calcutta was possibly the best available. It provided not only the space for strong fortifications and a growing trade center, but also being 130 kilometers from the sea, a safe and commodious harbor for the large seagoing vessels of those days. Charnock was severely criticized by many of his countrymen for having chosen an extremely unhealthy site close to the steamy marshes of saltwater lakes. The location was actually, but the location was actually ideal from the navigational point of view, as also for defense being protected by the mighty Hooghly River on one side and a vast expanse of salt marshes and wetlands on the other. Now, the interesting thing to note about people, you know, this historian writing in 1990 is that he echoes almost verbatim. Historians like uh, Evan Cotton who had written you know, almost a century before, you know, 19, almost at the beginning of the 20th century, and this is the last decade of the 20th century. Evan Cotton had written in his book that Charnok alone can be credited for establishing the city. And there are many contradictory accounts. Some, some say that, you know, he had left behind him a planned organization for the city. Some say that, no, he did not leave behind a planned organization of the city. But despite these contradictory accounts, what is very clear is that, and I'll, uh, I'll quote Cotton again, and this is, this is actually, Cotton writes about a legend of how uh, Chanok even landed in the place where he suddenly got the inspiration to uh, establish Calcutta. So uh, if tradition is to be believed, Charnok first conceived the idea in days where Shutanuti, Shutanuti is the village where he landed. Shutanuti was the halfway house of a foreign uh, merchants, and he was accustomed to sitting and smoking a meditative hookah under the shade of a spreading people tree. And people like historians like Cotton and even post-colonial historians even tried, even have tried to locate where the tree was, where Charnok used to sit and smoke. So the tree is it's stood at the junction, which is now Bawazar Street in Calcutta and Lower Circular Road. So this is how the debates about whether uh, Charnok can be credited. And because all of these contentions were happening even while the empire was in its heyday. But the project of constructing an imperial nostalgia, it tries to put into abeyance all these 
multifaceted controversies and to present a unified, glorious view of men like Chano. And uh, this is why when uh, uh, you know historians describe Calcutta and even even many others, it's not just in British stories. Even today, if you read about Calcutta, Calcutta is supposed to be this place where uh, modernity has you know it's, it's gone berserk. Modernity has not been perfected, and therefore there is so much of you know a filth and the the tritus of colonial modernity, which which is still there in Calcutta. So this uh, narrative of the unchanging squalor of the East and the modernity of the West confronting this East, this narrative was started by British historians writing about Calcutta. And they couldn't, uh, of course, they couldn't reconcile the fact that uh, this was the place where they had set up the factory and where Fort William was established and where uh, Calcutta was also the place where Robert Clive had also come to uh, for his projects of annexation in Bengal. Despite the fact, the fact of the black town of Calcutta, the white town on the black town, even though the white town was pr pretty limited, it was located on the very, very small concentrated part of Calcutta. The black town could not be erased. And there were many, there were many attempts by the lottery committee, the Calcutta Improvement Committee of how to contain the expansiveness of the black town, how to contain the multitudes of the black town and how to civilize it, how to control its filth, how to control its ever expanding population. And the census reports uh, of Calcutta, and that is another uh, part of the knowledge system which has been created about Calcutta. The census reports always talk about how the population of Calcutta is so massive and they always compare the population of Calcutta with the population of, with the population of London. Uh, but coming back to, coming back to Charno, um, I'll share some other images. And this is how the contestation is happening. This is how uh, it is being contested by uh, the Savarna Roy Chaudhary family of uh, Calcutta and also the Calcutta High Court uh, that Calcutta really was not set up by, um, by Chano. I'm sorry, just let me find the... Uh, yeah. So... Uh, this is a part of the exhibition which happened, and that is the family. It's a family which today has traced its a very long lineage of uh, uh, itself. And this is the family which moved the public interest litigation, which led to the judgment of the Calcutta High Court in validating the role of uh, Chano. And uh, um, I'm sorry, this is constantly interrupting. No, 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 no. Uh, so this is what was uh, on display in the exhibition which I visited. And this exhibition has happened for many years. And if you see this, that's the title of the flex which is there. He is not the founder of Calcutta, 24th August is not the city's birthday, uh, Calcutta's birthday. And this is the, uh, the, the judgment of the Calcutta High Court in 2003, which they have quoted. So it's interesting how even the state has taken up a position in this contested history about the foundation of Calcutta. Of course, the Calcutta High Court had ex uh, uh, appointed an expert committee of historians to judge whether uh, all these debates, to judge the merit of these debates. And they had come to the conclusion that, well, the conclusion is right on the screen, that in the final analysis, neither Job Chanak uh, can be regarded as the founder of Calcutta, nor the claim that Calcutta was born on 24th August, 1690. Now, the interesting thing why this history, again, this history which the Savarna Roy Chaudhary family is trying to propagate. And if you see these, um, uh, papers. It has been established, printed even in newspapers in Calcutta. Uh, that's one of the most popular dailies of Calcutta, the Ananda Bajar Potrika, that's written in Bengali. Um, so most of these papers have also uh, publicized this revised history about the foundation of Calcutta. But the interesting thing is, uh, and this is where there is another kind of nostalgia, which this family is trying to propagate, 
is that uh, this family traces its own lineage back to Mughal India. And the present generation of the family says that we have our own Ghatoks. The Ghatok is literally a Bengali translation for the family genealogy. And they trace the heritage back to 35 generations to the Mughal rulers, Jahangir and Akbar. And there is a, a whole book uh, to talk about how, uh, yes, this is the book written by uh, Atul Krishna Rai. And this Lakshmi Kanta is the character whom the Savarna Roy Chaudhary, which still exists in Calcutta today, and Atul Krishna Rai, who was the assistant census officer in Colonial Calcutta, uh, in the in 1900 in 1900 and 1910 the interesting thing about this book uh, lakshmi kanta a chapter in the social history of bengal is that this was not released in the public domain it it, it the uh, it was published in 1928 but it was never released to the public domain and the reason is very clear if you read the contents of the book because it, it starts with uh, the structure of Hindu society, and uh, it starts with it starts with saying how the Brahmins are, a, are the uppermost and the superior caste of, Bing, of uh, Bengal and India, and how it is unfortunate that modernity has tried to disturb the hierarchy of the caste system. And Lakshmi Kanta, who uh, is the who is supposed to be the progenitor of this long line of uh, the Savarna Roy Chaudhary family, he is the hero of this book. So for me, what was it's very interesting and it's uh, disturbing also, I would say, of how when the British are writing their history, they are propping up their heroes, their myths and their legends. And when that history is today being revised, what, is, what do we have? We have a, an upper caste Brahmin family who is popularizing its called father called Lakshmi Kanta. And this book is how uh, this book is about how Lakshmi Kanta is actually the one who had uh, converted the entire marshy land of Calcutta into a place. Uh, and of course, it was not called Calcutta then; it was called Hali Shahar or Borisha, the ancient localities. Sorry, sorry for using the word ancient, but the older localities which predated the establishment of Calcutta. They credit Lakshmi Kanta uh, Ganguly. Lakshmi Kanta. There are many titles which she has been given. And they credit him with, uh, you know, bringing some kind of habitation or making this part of Calcutta, this making this part of Bengal a habitable land. Uh, now, the reason why, uh, for me, it is, uh, or for any other historian who is reading these histories today, is because it seems to be a project of competing nostalgias. Is it a project of competing nostalgias? Because Atul Krishna Ray was very well aware of what he is doing. Because if you read the history of Calcutta, which he wrote for the government in 1902, he has written a very different history there. He does not justify the supremacy of the Brahmins in that uh, British census, uh, census of India, uh, census of Calcutta, which is which was written under the, uh, the supervision of the colonial government. And there's a very different history, different narrative which he writes in this book. Um, I think I'll stop there. Uh, there. There was, I think I'll stop there. I, I thought of reading some sections from the book Lakshmi Kanta and showing uh, some really uh, interesting sections of it, of how uh, Lakshmi Kanta has also been mythologized, you know, lionized by Atul Krishna Ray. And it, what, what was extremely interesting is the position of this person himself, Atul Krishna Ray, because of, uh, when nationalism emerged as a derivative discourse to quote Partha Chatterjee in Bengal, there was the, uh, there would, you know, it was like a divide of the intelligentsia, of the liberal Hindu intelligentsia in, in Bengal. There was one was the, the modern self, which was confronting the modernity of the state. And one was the, the, the self in the personal domain. And over there, it was where they negotiated the tradition. That is a very bad rehashing of Partha Chatterjee. But for me, the uh, the person who I am for me what is interesting is the role of his, a historian like Atul Krishna Ray and uh, how he confronts our older uh, lineage of the uh, of Calcutta's history starting from you know medieval uh, so-called medieval history and 
I'm very aware of the controversies. Uh, I've said with a bit of caution about how uh, uh, Indian history has been periodized. So keeping that in mind, uh, Ray talks about a uh, history of Bengal starting from medieval India, starting from uh, Mughal Empire, and uh, historians like Bastid or Macaulay talk about a history of Calcutta, which uh, has been established by uh, Chanuk in the 17th century. So that is where the discontent of writing the history, Calcutta, uh, history of Calcutta comes in. And the reason why it becomes even more uh, contested is where the, the state tries to step up and uh, take a stand on this on these debatable issues. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Heba. This was a extremely rich and, and really, really interesting and, you know, really well argued um, uh, uh, paper. And I, and I really enjoyed it. And um, we have a good, good number of people who are online now, I think about a dozen. Uh, I'm sure a lot have questions and comments. And as we are many, uh, may I suggest that um, everybody uh, just asks one question so that we certainly have enough time for a first round. And if we see that there is more time, we can then sort of, you know, add to that. Um, also, may I ask uh, everybody to just very quickly give their affiliation or introduce themselves very quick so that we know who they are. Um, so without further ado, let me just open for uh, Q&A. Who would like to start? Okay, let, Carl, please. Yes. Very, very quick and, and somewhat abstract question. First of all, uh, so, so interesting uh, for those of us who have followed uh, Calcutta, you know, as, as historical a uh, place. Um, this just deepens so many of the, of the um, understandings we have, um, and I appreciate that so much. Um, could you just comment on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the particular approach you took to um, empires and cities um, in, in, this, in this talk? Uh, it, it feels to me like it overlaps with a concern we have in the, in the theory track um, uh, of these uh, dream conversations that were we're, we're having at, at GUP um, about uh, cities as texts and, and the texts that you read are so uh, deep and, and, and complicated um, and conflicting. And I just wanted to hear you maybe uh, elaborate a little bit on maybe the methodology that, you, um, that, you're, that you're bringing to this, uh, this topic. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, sir. Um... There, were, there was a lot more which I could have uh, said, but unfortunately, because of my very bad photo sharing skills, I couldn't share a lot more. So the, this exhibition, which I went to, it was a very interesting exhibition and there were many uh, photos and many uh, memorabilia of the family, which I was talking about. And they, they, had, they had personal items of the family, which was on display. So it was really projecting a kind of, uh, this is where we belong in the city. And this is us laying claim, this uh, us laying claim to the heritage of a city. And they have tried to extend the heritage beyond, or you know, to pre to a time which predates uh, Charnock's uh, foundation of the supposed foundation of the city. My methodology has been so. Yeah. So sorry to complete the first part of what you said. City as a text. Now it's very interesting that the current chief minister, Mamta Banerjee of Bengal. Some years ago, she declared that she wants to modernize Calcutta. And uh, literally, there was a Big Ben, the, which was constructed in Calcutta. And it, it literally mirrors the Big Ben, which is there in Calcutta. And there have been a lot of debates about this, about how you know, the, the colonial nostalgia doesn't really seem to go away from Calcutta at all. So you have uh, reports, for example, the other day I read that Warren Hastings, you know, another person who does not need any introduction, his house has been modernized by the Archaeological Survey of India. So this interest in uh, what I said in the beginning of quoting Sumit Sarkar, the, the, the colonial architecture of the city of palaces, you know, despite the fact that modernity has actually gone berserk in Calcutta and despite the uh, Calcutta being what it is today, 
that it's unable to give up the ghost of its fascination or its nostalgia for the colonial past. My methodology has been uh, simply to cons consult as many historical texts I could lay my hands on, um, starting from Macaulay's text, which is available everywhere, and a lot of uh, these histories which are available in the public domain. And um, in order to uh, bring out the richness of this contestation of the founding of Calcutta, etc., I visited this um, exhibition um, which was held in February last month. And I spoke to, uh, it was just a few interviews with uh, Devoshi Roy Chaudhary, who is the present, you know, the curator of this museum, which I uh, shared a photo of. And uh, he is the present, uh, you know, the most prominent person in the family, which moved the public interest litigation of the High Court, which led to that judgment of 2003. So it has been um, you know, a mixed methodology of, of uh, visiting that part of Calcutta, which houses this uh, exhibition, which houses this uh, ancient building. It's a very old, I'm sorry, let me try and see if I can share uh, a few more uh, photos of that part of Calcutta where uh, uh, this place is located. Uh, so my methodology basically, yeah, it's been, I hope that answered your question, sir. So let me just, uh, yeah. So this is um, a photo of that part of Calcutta where uh, the museum is housed and this is where the exhibition was also held. And I visited this place and I, spoke to the curator of the museum and he was very you know very passionate in his defense of his heritage of his family and he was very caustic about British historians who have glorified the role of Chanok so yeah. um let me jump in Heba uh, but before I do, let me say that anybody who wants to ask a question, please just raise your virtual hand so that I sort of, you know, can make a list of, you know, through to go through. Well, I don't know where to start, but I mean, this is, I had so many, um, I, I wanted to show so much more and so many, you know, um, follow up questions because it was, you know, really so interesting to me. So let me just, you know, start with one, okay? Why in the late 19th century? Why does this... Um, this, uh, you know, interest uh, or this push for a, a, a nostalgic rereading or this, um, a, you know, inquiry, uh, basically why we should have a nostalgic sort of rereading of the origins of the start of the, of the British Empire. Why in Calcutta? Why does this start in the, in the late 19th century? Um, are, there, are, there, are there parallels somewhere else in India or beyond? Is this a very specific, local specific sort of issue? What, what's going on here? Right, um, thank you, sir, for your question. It was definitely not a localized uh, event. I think uh, Peter Mitchell's book, which I quoted in the uh, quoted in my presentation, he writes about how late Victorian Britain was obsessed about writing its own glorious history of, of empire. And the reason why I think uh, all, all of these events are happening in Calcutta, where Atul Krishna Ray has been appointed by the colonial government to write a history of Calcutta. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, others, uh, British historians are also writing histories of Calcutta where they have glorified the role of uh, Holwell, Clive, Chanok, etc. Is that 1880, late 19th century is when the Indian National Congress is formed. Nationalist organizations are formed in Bengal. Calcutta was al also became, because Calcutta was always the place where you had a massive army of reserve labor. And this is the topic which I'm interested in because of migration happening from the other parts of India into Calcutta, because of the sheer fact that all these areas were impoverished, they were deindustrialized. They were even depopulated because of famines happening in Northern India. A lot of survivors, they just fled to Calcutta just for basic livelihood. So this, you know, this immense excess of population is something which is, which the empire is unable to, you know, stomach because they constantly write about how Calcutta, in Calcutta, they have not been able to perfect modernity and they have not been able to 
tame the excess pop, excessive population of Calcutta because it, Calcutta did not remain the the, the very uh, you know charming colonial city which the colonial writings uh, they imagined Calcutta to be. It it became a place where uh, the countryside is teeming inside it. They're thronging Calcutta to look for jobs. So a lot of uh, housing, small housing settlements came in, this sprang all over Calcutta without, literally without, in, in a very unplanned manner, as it should, because planning was always, so planning was always a part of the colonial city, colonial, uh, the municipality's plan of how to bring some kind of order in this, you know, disarray of uh, housing, of labor shortages, et cetera, uh, sorry, labor migration in Calcutta. So I think the reason why this project of constructing nostalgia happened is because to think of some time where all of these problems did not happen, where the British had just come and they were, uh, you know, uh, engaging with the ruler of Nawab, the, the, the Nawab of Bengal. And of course, that was a violent confrontation, but it was a confrontation which empire was absolutely suited to do. You know, a history of conquest, a history of win and loss, a history of defeating the supposed oriental despot with his excessive violence and cruelty. So they wanted to construct that history. They wanted to construct and uh, encourage fellow their fellow British uh, people in the their, their fellow English, the, the British society in uh, back in back back home. That look, this is what we did. This is what we've done. And uh, also another major reason is because after 1857, after the East India Company no longer remained the one at, you know, on charge at the, of affairs in Bengal, of the political establishment in Bengal, and the rule was transferred to the British crown. That is another time where, uh, administ where the administration of Bengal, it became more bureaucratic. Uh, and uh, instead of, the company officials, it was bureaucrats who were taking charge. And a new kind of rule was being established in Calcutta, uh, in which the East India Company had very little role to play. So uh, it was, you know, a few, supposed a few noble, courageous men who had gone into Calcutta and set up factories and who had uh, civilized the land and who had cleaned the marshes and who had established uh, trading settlements and housing settlements and who had encouraged people also to come and migrate. That kind of history was missing in the late half of empire because modernity had become more complicated. The city landscape had become more complicated. So this is where the role of nostalgia comes in to simply point out to a simpler time where all these problems of modernity did not have to be confronted, where the, uh, it was not the British crown which was ruling, Cal uh, which was ruling India and Bengal and Calcutta, but it was simply the East India Company, which was trying to manage the administration of Bengal. So I think that is where the role of nostalgia comes in. And that is where all of these imperialist histories have been written in praise of the uh, first, uh, what should I say, imperialists of uh, Calcutta, because all of these histories are very much lionizing these early uh, colonialists in Calcutta. Yeah. Thank you so much, Heba. Just two, one, two very quick comments and then I'll hand back to, to Carl. So it appears to me that your answer made two implied arguments. One is, amongst others, let me just you know, point out two. One is that the, that the central and perhaps the only audience of this discourse of nostalgia was British society that there weren't, that it wasn't also directed at least to some sector of Indian Calcutta society, maybe upper middle class, whatever it may be. That, that was at least what I heard. The other you know, assumption was that while you said yes, I mean, it's part of a larger basically map of nostalgia around that point in time, um, you still started, and I think that makes a lot of sense, right? But you started locally. You basically said this was a reaction to what was going on in Calcutta itself, in Calcutta itself. And that makes a lot of sense. At the same point in time, I'm asking myself whether, at the very least, making this sort of claim um, became more doable and perhaps um, more 
was more readily, readily heard by people at home in Britain or by maybe some people in India, because other people in other cities in India and perhaps other people elsewhere in the imperial world made similarly nostalgic arguments about the early days of empire too. So I don't know what to do. This is the answer may as well be no, that's not true. This is really, you know, this story here, right? And it's not part of something else. Um, there may be an inter-imperial sort of element here, right? An element whereby, you know, people not only in the British Empire, perhaps but perhaps in other empires too, are starting to make, you know, similarly nostalgic arguments or arguments about nostalgia. I don't know. It's just something to sort of, you know, throw out there. Um, okay. But let me hand back to Carl. Carl, please. Well, I'm happy to hear Hiba talk, talk about what you just brought up first. That, that sounds very interesting. Did, did you want to say something about that? Um, I, I think I would, um, I think, take the suggestion which uh, Sir just gave, which, which uh, that to connect these uh, constructions of nostalgia with what was happening elsewhere. And I think I will revise a few of the things that I said. And But again, I think I will also consider seriously the fact that these, the audience of uh, imperial nostalgia construction was not just those in Britain, it was also in India. It was also the uh, anti-colonial intelligentsia which was emerging in India. And it the colonial state was extremely interested in reminding them that this was what they did. This was how this was the glory of empire, and that is how they, that is how it began. So when they provide the moral legitimacy and the sentimentalization of empire, so it is not just to convince those back at home, but it's also to convince uh, to convince the colonized that uh, th we are not evil people. This is what we did. We literally gave you a whole city in which this is our modern gift to you. So I think, yes, the audience was also the, not just the colonial, but also the, those who were colonized. So I mean, if, if, if one, gener if like one, ge if yeah. one generalizes what you just said now, then this basically means on some level that it is Indians, I mean, I'm, I generalize here and just say Indians, who yeah. actually caused the empire to change its tune and to, at the very least, revise how it rhetorically presents itself to the outside world. That's a really, really interesting argument, right? And if you think about people who have written about the rhetoric of empire, there is a book, for instance, by co-written by Martin Thomas, or Thomas Martin, I never think Martin Thomas, anyway. Um, uh, or Thomas, no, Thomas Martin, a rhetoric of empire. Uh, uh, there it is, um, uh, I think, if I re remember correctly, right? And to just cite one book that has been recently written about this, that it's a more internalist reading of why the changes happen. And your, if, if this is true, right? Your account is actually, is, is more complicated, right? So I find this super interesting. Carl, please. Uh, yeah, this might might overlap with what what Sir was just said. Um, I, I'm interested in this counter narrative um, that you uh, that you brought to us, and 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 the exhibition based on it, the books uh, that that fuel it. It seems uh, just from your own description of it, a little thinner, uh, quite a bit thinner than the nostalgic narrative. Um, it, it it seems to be focused on this one family. Um, and I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the actual structure of the narrative. Is it, is it saying that this family is responsible for the foundation of this city, number one? And secondly, this, this is another sort of deepening question about both narratives, both uh, nostalgia narrative and counter narrative. Um, it, it strikes me that neither can, can uh, wish away the fact that there were um, pre-existing settlements at this particular bend in the Hooghly, right? This, this, is, this is something we all know. Um, is, is, what, what role do those settlements play in, in, in both of the, these narratives? Because it, it seems like, you know, the name Calcutta comes from a village, Calicata, Vidi, Calicata. We know, we, 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 
we seem to know that. I, I may be wrong about that, but it'd be interesting to just hear a little bit about that vision because it seems to me a, a you know a, a Brahmin family like the one you described has you know more or less um, uh, as thin a connection to that set of pre-existing villages as uh, you know Job Charnak does. Right. Um, so uh, it's it's very interesting to thank you for that question. That was a very interesting question. For me, what was really interesting to see about of how far they can stretch the genealogy of that family. So um, this book, which I shared, that that book is named after it's of the the eponymous hero of that book, Lakshmi Kanta. He is supposed to be uh, the person to whom that entire jagir or you know, this entire tract of land, which is present day Calcutta and present day uh, two adjoining districts, the 24 Parganas, that entire land was given to him because of his services to the Mughal Empire. So he was a zamindar of this land. But of course, it wasn't called Calcutta then. Calcutta was a very British name. And of course, it wasn't a modern city in his time. But then uh, as per this book, as per the book which is written by Atul Krishna Ray, he was the one who encouraged weavers, he was the one who encouraged them to set up markets. And uh, so th that is the kind of pre-existing settlement which, which you talked about, that before the coming of Charnok or before the coming of the British, the settlement which existed there was, uh, there was a very vibrant weaving community there was a rich cotton cloth market, which was, which was there in Chudanuti, that village. So, uh, so that is the existence. These facts, the existence of these facts, has been elaborated by the judgment of the Calcutta High Court. The Calcutta High Court does not, of course, talk about the very rich genealogy of this family. That has been done after uh, the Calcutta judgment, the High Court judgment has been passed. This exhibition, which I went to, it's in its, uh, I think, its 15th edition of that uh, exhibition, and they call it a history festival. And where it's one family talking about this is our history. And they even have, uh, you, like I said, their household objects on display, and they have tie ups with the and artifacts of the Indus Valley civilization were put on display in this exhibition. And that is where you see of how one family's interest in tracing its genealogy has connections with institutional arrangement. The archaeological survey is the institutional arrangement of archaeological research in India. And that is, that is where the interest, interesting links uh, come up. But this project of you know, denying that Chanuk had any role to play, this is not new. I think this is where I think call it liberal, you call it conservative, because it was both. They were trying to confront uh, modern, they were trying to confront empire and modernity with the English education which that they had received. But they were also trying to justify the, their own, uh, to, the, to themselves, of their own society. Because when uh, Macaulay writes in his essay on Clive, that the Bengalis are weakling, that they have no interest in, uh, you know, uh, resistance that so they, they are so they are entire, they're entirely a weak race so they this book by Atul Krishna Ray says that no from the time of Lakshmi Kanta Ganguly from the time of uh, before Chandra before all the British came the Bengalis were extremely valiant race they had uh, look at all these castes of Bengal the all these upper castes they were extremely talented in uh, wielding weapons so it's very interesting to see how uh, nationalists I don't know if, whether to call him a nationalist or what, because the tone which he adopts in the census, Cal census of Calcutta is very different. Whether a person like Atul Krishna Ray, how he is trying to counter not just the colonial myths of Calcutta, of establishing Calcutta, but also the caste stereotypes which colonial, which colonial administrators had put in, you know, and these caste stereotypes were about everyone. They said uh, they had uh, an entire sociology of caste stereotypes on the basis of which castes were enumerated, classified, and that's a whole other domain of knowledge altogether. The, for example, uh, North Indian Muslim weavers were supposed to be bigoted and who were only interested in their own mosques and mills. And this is what colonial sociologists and administrators wrote. And in a similar vein, Bengalis were said to be an extremely weak race. 
and the reason why the stereotype had also come i think because it was so easy for them it was so so easy for the british to uh, you know this is what they thought that it was so easy for them to take over uh, bengal and to, bengal was one of the places which was colonized uh, right from the get go of uh, empire so yeah um heba let me uh, carl do you want to add something uh, no you go ahead um okay let me jump in because i don't see any other hands up right now um a comment first and then a question here's the comment so i i thought about a bit more um about your point that this discourse of nostalgia was targeted not only at the british but also an indian audience if if slash as this is true i wonder whether the very text the literary the literariness of these texts that you use are characterized not only by a tone of nostalgia which will be meant for the british audience but also by another tone right because nostalgia i mean i just thought about this for one minute so I, i'm sh i may be totally wrong but i think nostalgia is something that you principally think principally it's a feel that you have vis-a-vis -vis yourself about your own past I, I, on some level some other i'm sure is there too but it's 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 perhaps not that central but the in in the if this discourse of nostalgia is of the, is this discourse is also targeted at the indian audience then I'm not so sure that it's only about nostalgia. Then I think the tone, there must be a second tone there too, a more assertive tone, right? That's not simply nostalgic. And if this is true, then I wonder whether the texts that you read are really on some level more complex, right? Because that then would mean that you have a nostalgic tone, but also an other tone. And I don't know whether how to call this assertive, self-justifying, whatever it might be. In, in short, I wonder, and this is my comment, and you know, I wonder that if you do a really close textual reading of those texts, whether you can see tensions between these different tones, moods, genres, as it were, right? And you don't even have to go as far as, you know, think this, you know, Hayden White and other people who think about, you know, particular textual genres and things of that sort, just just to think about the, the possibility that multiple audiences for the same texts means that the same text has different moods, different tones, and what this would mean for your analysis. Okay, so that's that's my comment, whatever, whatever it's worth. My my question is this. So when you started to talk about, you know, the Brahmins, the, this Brahmin family saying, no, this was actually us, you know, we started this, you sort of, you had a throwaway line, and you said, they basically say that we were this because we drained the swamps, we basically made this city, you know, what it is. This sounds pretty technocratic to me, right? Like, we had the means to do this. Yeah. And I say this because if this is true and if this is the correct reading of what it means to drain a swamp, right, and to make a city habitable, then I wonder whether this isn't an unsaid parallel, if not similarity, to how the British basically presented their own right to have been the first. In other words, is there an unsaid parallel is between the Brits and what they say, and you know this Brahmin family and what they say, and and if this is true, is this simply sort of a you know a, a nice example of you know a post-independence upper class, you know, basically unsaid replication of what the colonizers did before. Yep, um, that that that's a great observation. Thank you, sir, and. Uh, I think, okay, so to the first uh, part of your comment, um, yes, definitely, all these texts are definitely more than nostalgia, because after that first nostalgic tone in which they talk about how uh, there is a need to 
you know recognize the beginnings of the of calcutta's history there is a need to recognize the, those who suffered in the black hole tragedy and the, and after that they go and give a very detailed uh, account of the white town of calcutta that these are the buildings these are the people who lived there this is uh, the the history the 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 you know, basically they, they, they give a record of events that this is what happened uh, the the black hole tragedy happened and then warren hastings came and then the lottery committee in which uh, you know the lottery committee was talking about improving calcutta and so they give a long list of historical events and it's interesting to note how uh, how and where they talk about the colonized about those who were the indians the, where and where and when do they talk about the indians in their texts and i did not have time to go into go to go into that but it's also very interesting to note that when they talk about you know the colonizers in the rock about the indians they uh, they are just there in the background they are not they don't have as much space and this and this is something which even sumit sarkar writes that they don't have much space in these texts most of the text is about the very small limited part of calcutta which was the ruling establishment of the white town and which today is overrun by a lot of commercial establishments so you can't distinguish that this is exactly where so today in modern calcutta you can't distinguish the white town from the from the black town so um so yeah that there is more than just nostalgia there is also history there is also a record a setting up for record the history of calcutta and uh, because when they say that history is being like ignored they will of course provide an answer to it that this is what uh, is being ignored by both people in india and in britain for your other comments sir i think that that's absolutely correct because uh, one thing which i have noticed is that not many other historians have written about the savarna roy choudhury family for example in in partha chatterjee's book which is not very long ago the black hole of empire he does not discuss the calcutta high court judgment he does not discuss the uh, the book by atul krishna ray and he does not talk about the savarna roy choudhury family and i so this book which was just there lying in the exhibition and i bought it on reading it it seems a lot of it is just you know just legend and there is literally very historical very very little historical detail and it's just you know lionizing this one person and this other family so it how much of it can be called history and how much of it can be called uh, you know smith of one family it's it's just you know extremely uh, debatable because for me it doesn't seem like what we call history uh, but it's interesting for me to see that this book is out there in the public domain and it is being shared with the public in calcutta uh, by this family so it's very interesting for me to see that what you said about the parallel that this is what the british did under chanaks regime and this is what uh, lakshmi kanta did i don't think there can be a parallel because the modern state of course has more wherewithal to uh, you know to tame the land so to speak to uh, drain swamps to make the land a habitable place so i really doubt if um a lot of this or a lot of these claims which are being made by atul krishna ray in his book uh, whether a lot of it can stand up to historical scrutiny and another reason i think uh, and this is something that i said in my presentation that maybe this is another reason why this book was not there in the public domain for for long when it was written in 1928 it was circulated privately so um i haven't had time to to do this because i came across this book just last month what would be really interesting for me to see the journey of the circulation of this of this myth or or history or whatever it is that this family calls it from when it was written till today of uh, how did it reach the public arena and how uh, other historians who are that there is so much of copious amount of historical writing in bengal how do they engage with it and uh, how do they place it really in the debates about the foundation of calcutta and about whether at all there was uh any uh, recorded history of calcutta before the coming of the east india company and the setting up of the factories because it was not called calcutta then even in atul krishna ray's book he says that it was called holi shohar they are bengali names they are bengali names of villages and uh, these names uh, what happened to these names and what happened when calcutta itself was established um these are things which i still need to uh, read up on and um, so so yeah I, i don't have conclusive answers to the questions which you gave but yeah thank you for those comments because they make me think a lot more about 
the politics of circulating certain texts in the public arena of why certain texts are released and how these texts are received not just the texts of british historians but even the texts which i which i got my hands on in that exhibition which i visited um yeah i think it would be really worthwhile to track this history of yeah. how this family presents itself and makes its case um to perhaps clarify my question didn't I, I didn't sort of ask about the historical truth of the claim but about okay. the content of the claim itself right and whether that content bears a parallel to the british claims content whether both yes, of them have yes. a technocratic sort yeah. of um you know aspect or perhaps even core uh, if i may add one quick thing and now you can totally push back against me if you think I just say nonsense, okay? But if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, technocratic knowledge wasn't really central to how Brahmins from the later 19th century in general explained why they thought they should be or continue to be central to whatever section of Indian society there is, right? So it, it wasn't that sort of, you know, modern knowledge, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't really central to their self-presentation as, I don't know, let's co call it a social group. I don't know whether we can call it a class, but anyway, a social group or a class. Yeah. yeah. It was more ideologically based, maybe more religiously based on some level, right? They have a particular role to play in this very sprawling, universe of that one now calls hinduism right um and if this is true then there is a tension between how they present how this specific family i know this is a particular case right but then there will be a tension between the technocratic way in which this particular family presents itself and says why we are important to Kolkata, to how brahmins more generally explain why they are central to basically late 19th century early 20th century british colonial india so i don't know step making it do you see a tension of this sort or am i there totally making this up there or are many many tensions in their self presentation absolutely so you're absolutely right there are many tensions in the way uh, the family presents the history of brahmins uh, but interestingly they don't so when Ray writes about the, this, this particular character, he doesn't start off uh, by writing that, look, this person had the wherewithal of, you know, colonial, of any kind of modernist knowledge. He starts by saying that, look, this is the structure of Hindu society. And he even, you know, he even weaves in stories of Hindu gods and myths of Hindu gods. So it's, it's, it's really very... Okay. Honestly, that book really, it can, it's, I don't know how much of it is really can be called uh, historical, historically verifiable, any of it that he has written. So there are many tensions in the way he presents the history of this family. But for me, what is really interesting is not this text, but for me, what is interesting is the judgment of the High Court, yeah. where in, yeah. in 2003, where the Kankata High Court and the the, the litigation is filed by this family itself. And this character, Lakshmi Kanta, is actually named in the Calcutta High Court judgment. Yeah. Now, of course, the Calcutta High Court judgment uh, does not go into the myths of, the, of this family and he doesn't go into uh, the heroic adventures which this person did. But what they do state is that the pre-settlement of, uh, of uh, this part of Bengal, which existed prior to the coming of the British, was something which was, you know, because of uh, men like Lakshmi Kanta. This is something which the Calcutta High Court talks about. Yeah. And uh, for me, what is ex extremely interesting is not what happened back then, but what happened in 2003, that the state tried to undo the history of, uh, tried to undo these foundation myths of empire by saying yeah. that yeah. Tano not be called. And what was even more interesting was after that, there was an actor, there was a Bengali film actor who had said, happy birthday, Calcutta. And he, he wrote this on Facebook. And then this family sent him a legal notice. 
saying that you can't write that anymore. It's <laughs> illegal to write that. So you can't yeah. state that. Yeah. So for me, what is... Yeah. Uh, That's fascinating. So I read that book, book because it's there in the public domain, but um, I found it extremely difficult to cite any part of it in my paper, uh, Ray's book. But what I have quoted is the judgment of the High Court and how the High Court places itself in a historical debate. Right. Of how right. the state tries to place itself, place itself yeah. in a historical debate about the foundation myths of cities. Yeah. Jinan, uh, Carl, please. One, one last thing that I just happen to know a little bit about, but uh, I'm sure you um, have explored as well, is that you know, uh, Charnak is, is a very complex um, founder, as, as, you, as you know well. Um, he's not just a hero, he was also a, a kind of cautionary tale, I think, especially for the post-conquest um, um, regime uh, as you know as the, the company itself takes over Bengal um, and begins to uh, try to um, enforce a certain amount of separation um, between um, British uh, officials and uh, their and and Indian elites um, Charnak becomes the sort of um, the other kind of in the past narrative, it may not be nostalgia, it's more of a cautionary tone. You know, he's, he's the one who saves his Indian uh, uh, partner, sexual partner, wife from a sati. He's the one, the, the, the picture of him under the tree with a hookah is, is a, as a, you know, a kind of uh, almost Euro-Asian person, a person who went native um, when, uh, when he shouldn't have, um, along with all the, Ruhaha about Hastings and others and uh, his wife and the emeralds and so on and so forth. These are all uh, cautionary tales as well as heroic tales. That I don't know if that's something that that, that comes up in the counter narratives at all, uh, uh, but it, it's just another piece of, of how this foundation myth was used for imperial um, uh, propaganda. Um, thank you, sir. That thank that's that's actually all these things have been written by the volume which I spoke about in the 1990s when this volume came out came about. So all of these things were said that it's impossible to determine the veracity of who was Chanok's wife. And uh, yes, it's mentioned that he supposedly rescued a woman and then he married her and then after her death he used to sacrifice a cop on her grave and so it, it all of these. Uh, as you say, these cautionary tales of Chanok are uh, are written, and um, so so yeah. Now that you have told me, I think it's I, it, it's interesting to rethink about what the role of Chanok is in these texts. Do they present him as a cautionary tale, as you say, or whether they present him as some kind of imperial hero? But um, but despite that, uh, despite all the controversial all the controversial notes about his, um, his lifestyle in Calcutta. <laughs> What these texts write in a very clear-cut manner is that he is credited with the founding of Calcutta. So that is that is something which they constantly give a trust to. And uh, so this, this may seem to be just a fact, but they even present this fact in a very colorful manner of how he, of the numerous times he came to Calcutta, of once when he was stricken by fever. So it's, it's and they're different, versions of this narrative in different texts in different texts uh, so that is what I was trying to um, uh, figure out in my paper that's, that's what I was trying to trace but then when you but then up, now I'm thinking of whether uh, they've written about Chanov as uh, somebody who props up imperial nostalgia or whether they present him as a kind of cautionary tale that, this, that the things which he did are not what British or, the, or the, what the British are supposed to do that uh, you should not emulate what the things which he did. So, yeah, I'll I'll have to rethink some of the things which. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. This is so interesting, and uh, all your responses were really, really very interesting. Thank you. Um, Heba, if I may, one uh, last sort of you know side note. Um, uh, at least on last on my part, uh, we still have time. Um. You know, a, a possibly interesting parallel could be Singapore, 
which you know presumably is founded in 1819 by a British officer called Raffles, right? Uh, and then in the particularly in the later 19th century, later 20th century, people started historians in, in Singapore and beyond. And I'm sure activists too started to you know, get more interested slash pay more attention to the pre-19th century settlements that had existed there. And, and I wonder whether the um, politics of history that played out in the, later in the later 20th century in Singapore around this whole question could be an interesting, not, not at all that you need to incorporate any of this into your, into your paper, right? But just like to think with other cases about your own case in order to tease out even better what is specific about and distinct about what you do. <coughs> and also, whether, they, whether and at the same point in time, to what degree it is, it is, it forms part of a larger pattern, right? Singapore has a much, I think, less, ad, not adversarial, but let's say it has a much more positive relationship to its British past that, that okay. India has, right? We know this. So I'm sure, and so, and I remember I was in Singapore, I think six, seven years ago, and I remember there, I mean, there's the statue and everything, you know, Raffles, you know, people talk about him and he's, he's in the public sphere, right? Um, uh, um, and yet, I mean, there is this other side, you know, of Singaporeans, historians and others emphasizing this, you know, pre-British, pre pre-19th you know, century sort of route. So, yeah, just to make an argument um, uh, for the advantages of having parallel cases in your mind as you look okay. at your own case. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh... So if I could ask uh, Cyrus sir and uh, Carl, so uh, if uh, um, my paper is, no, my thesis is not really about the foundation myths of Calcutta or Imperial Nostalgia in Calcutta. It's about, you know, it's, it's about the migration of laborers, something completely different. But if yeah. I were to work on this into a publishable paper, what suggestions would you give of how to revise this paper? Carl. <laughs> That's, that, those are those are great th great thoughts. I mean, I, I hope I hope that some of these comments that we that uh, Cyrus especially has made will be useful in kind of uh, thinking everybody thinking it through. Uh, this does feel like a potentially you know a book length uh, thing uh, where you not only take this one particular case of I mean the High Court seems like uh, something that you really want to focus on, and I, I think the, the presentation. Uh, brings it up, but it was not at the center of the, of the presentation. And that, that could be something that you elaborate quite a bit more um, if you want to make it into a paper, I, you know, that's, that's focused solely on that. Um, it, it does seem like a very, very interesting event. Um, the, the, bigger, the bigger narratives that we were trying to, you know, uh, hear more about um, over time feel to me like a monograph. I mean, they feel a lot more like a, a you know, a, a, a multi-chapter um, you know, second project uh, to me. Um, it, it just feels like there's there's so much depth. The other the other uh, characters in the story that um, uh, you know would be really interesting to hear about are the um, you know the, the Bengali mercantile elite. After all, it's the Seths and the Bisaks and other people like that that are in those textile villages. <laughs> Uh, presumably, they have their own foundational un understandings about the uh, relation, you know, the relationship yeah. between Charnak and the city that um, they wrote, you know, immense. They must have written about them. I don't, I don't know um, for sure, but this this whole, uh, you know, gigantic Badrulok uh, elite, um, and it's the whole Bengal Renaissance can't have existed without some version of a, of, of a foundation myth for Calcutta. It just seems like it must be there as well. So, so just the, 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 the narrative over time, uh, the, the way it's retold over time um, feels like, uh, you know, very, very big project. Um, so but those are just, those are, those are just very, very off the cuff kinds of, uh, Thank of you, sir. but Thank you, sir. unbelievably interesting. And it just, it just, yeah, you know, it, it clearly um, th this this particular city <laughs> is so clearly uh, a keystone to the whole 
connection between the global urban and empire. And, and we, you know, we need to hear those, um, those city as text um, understandings of that um, in the context of the evolve evolving nature of empire itself. Um, because you, you you point that out, and I see what was pushing you to to understand what what's the context of these various changes in narrative along the way. I mean, it seems to me it's so so rich. Um, Thank you so much. So fun. needed, especially for this week. Yeah, I I would just second what the Carl said. Um, the, you know, the whole project is uh, the, the whole story is certainly worth a, a book uh, at the very least could be multiple peer-reviewed articles. Um, I think it's important, it would be important to um, identify exactly which part of the story you want to focus on and then turn this into the core of an article if that's what you want to do. And I agree with Carl that, you know, one, uh, you know, core could be the way in which the core deals with the whole thing. Um, but I could also see a, a, a super interesting, you know, paper, for instance, uh, uh, alternatively on the history of how this particular family presents itself from the interwar period into the late 20th century. I think that would be, you know, super interesting with a close reading of the documents and stuff. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's an embarrassment of riches that you have here, which, you know, is, is, a, is a great position to be in. Yeah. And uh, thank you for having me. So thank you. So no, much. it was really um, it, it was a wonder, wonderful um, uh, sort of conclusion to this online uh, seminar series we had. And and I want to you know thank you for uh, um, for applying and you know for talking uh, to us today. It was it was really great to have you. And you know as as with all the others, I very much hope that one can stay in touch and continue to have you know these conversations. I think on this note, I will stop the recording now. Okay. And uh, uh, I will do so. that.